I guess we should start. So uh, welcome everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, today, uh, Professor Boris Rubinsky, who got his uh, PhD in bioengineering from MIT in 1980 and then moved to Berkeley to be one of the founders of the Center for Bioengineering here at Berkeley. Uh, he uh, was a Silverman Distinguished Professor of Bioengineering for the year of 2000 to 2008. In 2008, founded the Center for Bioengineering in the service of humanity and society in Jerusalem. Led joint projects between the Hebrew University and El Quds, the largest Palestinian university, and Berkeley. And since he travels the world extensively for taking part in such similar projects uh, worldwide. Professor Rubinsky, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Eric, for organizing the meeting. <laughs> um, okay, now uh, I prepared 120 slides, uh, and uh, I will stop when, uh, whenever because essentially I wanted to give you a, a flavor of pretty much what I have done in the last 10 years. Uh, I have worked with the biomed industry uh, probably since the early 80s, uh, and I have experienced uh, all the different flavors of the biotech industry in the United States. And I want to give you, first of all, some of my uh, understanding or some, some of my conclusions. So uh, uh, I guess I'm going to make even more enemies than I have. Uh, one of the problems with the medical device industry in the United States is that it is a business. It's not a problem. Uh, every economy needs to be business directed, but it really acts as a business. And if you come with a new idea, and if the market is less than about 100 million annual sales, it turns out that it's not worth the effort. If you come and you found, find a cure to, for cancer, but it, it's not disposable, uh, then they probably will not take it. And usually there is a factor of 10 in price scale up over the cost of building the devices. Now, it's not all the fault of the medical industry or because it, it, it has to be a business. Uh, the environment in the United States is very difficult. This is actually a report that just came out this month about the FDA. Uh, the FDA uh, people are a nine to five job. And just to give you some sense here, essentially it costs about $31 million to have a 510K uh, product. 510K is the easiest product to be approved in the United States in, in terms of devices. It's essentially an equivalent device. Out of these $31 million you spend for a new device, $24 million are spent on the FDA uh, and the requirements of the FDA. And I know of many companies and many great ideas who just uh, gave up uh, because they couldn't pass the FDA approval. So there may be somewhere uh, the cure for cancer. Uh, the entire medical industry in the United States is driven by the medical insurance, which is private and big business. It's actually the main source of income to device companies, and new technologies are not covered. So uh, if after you pass the FDA spent $31 million for a small gizmo, uh, you now have to c convince the medical insurance that they really have to cover procedures with this uh, device. Now, uh, science and research, Berkeley. First of all, we all know that it's a business like every other business because you need to have your family and children uh, supplied with medical insurance. Uh, one of the driving forces is show me the Nobel Prize, and there is a very strong court mentality and flavor of the day research in uh, academia. So now that I have antagonized everybody, uh, let me tell you what uh, happened to me about 10 years ago. Uh, I decided that uh, I had enough of the game, and uh, I decided that I want to do a different type of research. First of all, research because you care research because you're curious, 
research in which you do not see the immediate financial benefits, and essentially research for the Ig Nobel Award and not for the Nobel Award because I don't want to have restriction in creativity. Um, and uh, essentially I began becoming really interested in what's happening in the rest of the world and not on only the United States because in my opinion uh, the medical care and the medical industry in the United States goes the way in which the big cars uh, of the 70s went uh, when the United States was building huge cars just for the United States. Japan was building small cars for their narrow streets. And when there was the economy crisis of oil, then essentially the Japan market took over. In my opinion, in five years, the same thing will happen here in the United States. We are building medical technology for, for huge gas-consuming cars, the medical uh, insurance, and the rest of the world is now coming together, and the medical industry in the United States, in my opinion, will fail in five years, if, if it doesn't change its ways. Um, so with this in mind, uh, I began trying to understand what is the medical problems around the world uh, and not to focus necessarily on what's important to the United States and to begin to try to solve problem, uh, find solutions for those problems. Now, there are many projects in which I was involved and that's the reason for those hundreds of slides. Uh, and what I will do is I'll just go from one solution to, from one problem and one solution to another until the time will be over and then I can give another lecture another time. So uh, one of the main problems is medical imaging. So f first of all, medical in imaging is really one of the biggest breakthroughs in medicine, probably the real biggest uh, in terms of device technology. It is indispensable. 20 to 30 percent of diseases cannot be treated without medical imaging. Now, on the other hand, according to the World Health Organization reports, two-thirds of the world population has no access to medical imaging. Uh, I just came back uh, about three weeks ago from Malaysia, where there was the International Conference on uh, Infectious Diseases. And Pretty much from all over the world, you have the same report. What are the problems in economically disadvantaged parts of the world? Well, there are three. There is no appropriate equipment because the equipment is too expensive. But once you get the equipment, you cannot maintain, maintain the equipment. I saw examples which devices that had no place to plug in for electricity. Uh, and the other problem is there is in inadequate training. So these three problems are problems that the big uh, gas-consuming cars of the American medical industry cannot provide a solution. And as the economy develops in Africa and in India and in China and in Malaysia, the big American cars will not drive there. So th there will be a need for a different type of solution. Just to give an example, since I was, became uh, recognized for the work that I'm doing, I just got after the earthquake in, uh, uh, essentially in uh, Haiti, uh, I got this email from uh, a very respectable organization, I, I erased the name, but here's what they write. We have installed an x-ray machine at the clinic, but on a recent visit I found it was not being used effectively because of the difficulty of handling and developing X-ray film in 3D world. So you go and you give a donation of, uh, of an X-ray machine and nobody knows how to develop an X-ray film. And even if you go to ultrasound, we also have a fairly new ultrasound machine uh, that we have installed in the clinic, but uh, really there is nobody to read the ultrasound. So, and that's typical everywhere you go. You have good intentioned people, they do donations, they give donations of medical devices, and nobody knows how to use them or they disappear. So we decided to address this problem uh, about well over 10 years ago, and we decided to develop medical imaging for the economically disadvantaged parts of the world. And uh, you can see here that uh, we decided to focus on uh, electrical impedance tomography and ultrasound because they are technologies that are inexpensive. 
So these, you, you cannot bring MRI, X-ray, or CT to a, to a small village, but you can bring electrical impedance tomography and ultrasound. Uh, now, I will discuss first about electrical impedance tomography, with which you are probably less uh, familiar. The problem with the EIT is that it requires heavy computing. And actually, we hit a solution already 10 years ago, uh, which is now uh, known as cloud computing. Uh, and this is from a report that came from Berkeley, computing as a utility. Frankly, we didn't know how to define it in this way at that time. Uh, and now there are services that uh, are essentially cell utility computing and essentially gives you the illusion of infinite computing resources and you don't have to buy computing. So what, what is electrical impedance tomography and why do you need cloud computing for it? So what electrical impedance tomography does, it essentially tries to recover a map of electrical impedance of the body. So the same way that uh, MRI, for instance, gives you a map of proton density, electrical impedance tomography gives you a map of uh, the electrical conductivity of different tissues. Different tissues have different values. And what you do is you inject currents uh, f from one electrode to another, and you measure voltages on all the other electrodes. And then you solve the field equation, essentially. So uh, these are subsensory uh, electrodes. You apply a voltage, you measure it, and at the end you solve what's called an inverse problem, and uh, you try to recover and produce the impedance map. What is the advantage? First of all, it's portable. All you need is an, a source of uh, power, uh, microsensory uh, currents, uh, milli uh, milliamps currents. It produces immediately a three-dimensional image, and it is inexpensive. And the main difficulty is really substantial computation needs, and it's really not uh, uh, commercially available. And I have a story about that, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll go over it. It has to do with why people move to MRI instead of electrical impedance tomography, although it started at the same time. So what it has is this is the hardware layout, the tissue surrounded by electrodes. Uh, you have to, so, and I promise not to go into the details of the equation, but essentially you have to solve huge equations with huge matrices, uh, 256 electrodes uh, around the body, and then uh, you have to invert matrices, and what you do is you guess a solution, and then you update it, you uh, have a Jacobian, and uh, so, so it, it, takes, it takes really lots of computation, which is good for, for the whole idea of cloud computing. So uh, what, w what was our idea? And uh, as you can see, we were issued a patent already in 2004. And at that time, we didn't know how to, to call it uh, cloud computing. We called it uh, essentially uh, distributed network computing. Uh, and the concept was the following. If you can separate the imaging measurement, the electrodes, from the imaging process con and connect them via a network. And then if the measurement is inexpensive and you send all the raw data to what's now called the cloud, you produce the image and you can return the data, the, the process data. Now this is very different from telemedicine. In telemedicine, in conventional telemedicine, the process data is done at the same site where you acquire the raw data and you send the process data through, through the internet or at that time or wireless. This idea is really truly cloud computing. You take the raw data and you send it and you process, process it somewhere else and essentially you can see in our first uh, slide and actually our patent is quite general because it says VO telecommunication and uh, uh, we developed here at Berkeley the entire technology. Uh, 
that, that actually now that I prepared the slide, I notice that we have all the elements that uh, actually appear now in uh, telemedicine, in uh, modern cloud computing medicine. If you can look here, let's see, let me use this. Uh, you can see on the top, we, we propose to have an application and patient database, data collection algorithm at the server side, and data acquisition control, and so on, and process the data and send it back. And our p first paper was also published in 2004. And actually, what we've done, we have done a real-time image of minimally invasive surgery, which is cryosurgery. We, uh, cryosurgery, you freeze tissue, and we were successful through this simple array of electrodes around the cryosurgical probe to send the raw data and to produce the image of the frozen region. So uh, this was done already in 2004, but then when we tried to implement this technology, we found that there are problems, and the main problem is the lack of infrastructure. And the, the, the main problem with infrastructure is that the telephone lines do not exist anymore, do not exist essentially in many parts of the world. But if you visit uh, uh, India, and I've traveled throughout India, you see people in the middle of the road with cellular phones where they don't have phone lines. And if you go uh, pretty much in uh, Mexico, you see it as well. And therefore, our idea was, let us try to use wireless data transfer to transfer the information. And wireless data is not necessarily cellular phone, OK? Uh, it can be the Zigbee, pro Zigbee protocol, Bluetooth, a whole variety of hierarchical stages of transferring of raw data. It doesn't have to be, it's not necessarily the cellular phone. And I started working with Mexico on this project. And you can see here what's happening in Mexico, essentially uh, typical to the entire world. Essentially, the, the land-based uh, telecommunication is slowly disappearing, and everybody is moving into cellular phones. So uh, we have decided to change uh, the idea and to move from what we call telecommunication, which at that time we, we thought of a landline, to move essentially into uh, simple data acquisition devices uh, and to use the cell phone to do essentially the same thing. Uh, we, we have built, we, we have developed some additional, I think, neat technologies that fit the cellular phone technology. So essentially, instead of uh, using two electrodes, one electrode to, to, uh, to inject current, the other one to remove current, and then lots of electrodes to measure voltages, it occurred to us that what we can do is we can simultaneously apply voltages or uh, apply currents in different frequencies at the same time and then measure the voltage at the same time and then decompose, Fourier decompose the, re the outcome. And each uh, source actually has its own frequency. So then you know exactly from which electrode you have sent uh, which signal. And now, instead of having a lengthy uh, procedure in which you just measure voltages and inject currents, now you can do everything at once, and then you send the signal to, do, to be Fourier decomposed at the remote computer facility. And again, the amount of data is less. It's more complex, but it's less. So that's, that's what we did. We built a small, uh, essentially, board for this. And this was our first uh, example. We can actually detect, it's in a, in a simulation 2D, but we can detect breast cancer uh, with just a simple array of electrodes. And uh, this was, the, the, uh, and I'll go back later to tell you where our project is uh, at this stage. Uh, at this stage, we're trying to actually develop this project for detecting breast cancer among the Palestinian uh, population, because the, there, there are very difficulties in uh, having access to mammograms and other uh, technologies of this kind. So I'll discuss this uh, shortly. 
the other technology that we developed was with uh, Arya Mayer, who's now here, and, and, and it has to do with ultrasound. Ultrasound is a very inexpensive medical imaging modality. What you do is you send, uh, you, you have a piezoelectric element, you send a pulse into the tissue. Wherever you have changes in acoustic impedance, the pulse is being returned. You measure the time of flight, and from that you reconstruct changes in the acoustic impedance. So slide A just is, is a function of time, and just shows you the signal as a function of time. So you can see, you send the wave, and you can see that one wave returns from here, another wave returns from here, and from that you know how far from the transducer is the, essentially the, um, the uh, changes in acoustic impedance. And from that you can do in slide B, essentially what you can do is you can produce a three-dimensional map, although ultrasound works in two dimensions right now. You send a wave, it comes back, and you essentially produce these two-dimensional images of a cross-section. Uh, and this is what ultras conventional ultrasound is. What is the problem with ultrasound? It is inexpensive. But what you need is an excellent hand-eye coordination. So you need, you've seen what the, the, the email that I got from Hawaii. They, they have brought an uh, ultrasound there. There is a person that can do ultrasound. It's very easy to do ultrasound, but it's very difficult to develop the hand-eye coordination and to begin to understand what you're seeing. So, uh, and, and the main reason is because it's two-dimensional. And essentially, if you have a two-dimensional image, you really need somebody to point the pointer in the right direction. So our idea was, and you can see here, this is the first paper that published this idea, uh, which was published last year, was let us take the entire row data that you produce when you move at random, essentially a, a two-dimensional ultrasound. Let's send the row data to uh, essentially a central processing facility, and let's produce a three-dimensional image, which then you can rotate, and you don't need the expert anymore at the ultrasound site to produce the three-dimensional image uh, or to analyze the hand-eye data in order to produce the right angle, because now you can do it somewhere uh, far away, and a nurse can go into, and can do this, take this two-dimensional image. So uh, essentially, this was the paradigm that we proposed, a raw data acquisition transducer at the patient side. And essentially, we believe that this is a very generic uh, modality for uh, medical uh, for devices uh, in economically disadvantaged parts of the world that solves their problem. You have a raw data acquisition at the patient side. You transfer the raw data wireless to a central processing facility, the cloud. And then, in our case, you produce the three-dimensional image, and you can reduce the cost by orders of magnitude of both of the device, the complexity. Uh, I'll answer questions later, okay? Uh, uh, so uh, this is essentially what, what we did, um, and I will show you uh, uh, Ari built the different components, but pretty much th this is what the, the entire technology is. It's a data acquisition device which you can pretty much buy commercially, uh, which means with cost for about $2,000. You have somebody, and I think, uh, did you do ultrasound before the experiment? Uh, OK, so you can take somebody that really is doing for the first time ultrasound, have him transfer the raw data of the two-dimensional images to the reconstruction uh, cloud, essentially, and then you get the image. And this is essentially what Arya did. He, he built a, a, a phantom with some seeds and so on. He moved the ultrasound with a constant rate of motion across the uh, three-dimensional uh, phantom, and he obtained three-dimensional images, which now can go to be analyzed now, this is my granddaughter uh, a year ago uh, in three-dimensional ultrasound, not mine. Uh, this is her last week uh, in my lab. 
And essentially what we managed to do is to take a technology that would all otherwise sell for about $100,000. That's how much a three-dimensional ultrasound system uh, work, uh, costs and make it into a couple of thousand dollar device that essentially provides services for uh, imaging. Uh, in general, our group is involved in several of these technologies and uh, uh, we're working on quite a variety of those and uh, with another opportunity I will talk about them. And now I want to go and again discuss another issue of diagnostic, which also we identified by by looking, so, so the, the way in which we uh, do our research is we first go and ask what are the problems that really bother people in economically disadvantaged parts of the world, <coughs> and then we try to solve them. One of the main problems is maternal and child death. Uh, now, uh, these are statistics which people probably know, but uh, essentially in economically disadvantaged parts of the world, uh, one in 22 births uh, will result in a death, and uh, in, in our area it's one in 7,300. How can you make a dent in this? And we checked, and it turns out that undetected internal bleeding is the cause of one in four maternal deaths worldwide. Uh, so if we can develop, so, so that's pretty much the way we go and develop our paradigm of research. We're, we're seeking problems, and we're seeking the problems where they occur, and uh, of course within the, our skills. Uh, and what we thought is that detecting internal bleeding after childbirth can save uh, many lives. Uh, the other issue is head injury, for instance. This is statistics in the <coughs> United States. Brain injury play an important part in child death. These are some statistics from the United States. There are no statistics for uh, the rest of the world, essentially. Uh, so we thought, well, perhaps detecting internal injury in the brain can also save the life of many children. Now, uh, how is conventional uh, methods for detecting these kind of injuries? What you do is you do diagnostic imaging. Uh, very expensive. It doesn't exist in rural Mexico. And uh, I worked with uh, Cesar Gonzalez uh, from 2003 on this project. He is in uh, Mexico. Uh, he spent a year here, and what we reached, the, the conclusion was that you don't need medical imaging in many circumstances. It is sufficient to know that some changes occur in the body that are indicative of uh, internal bleeding, and then there is enough time to send a woman after childbirth to a nearby city at a distance of about three or four hours. Uh, and I think in India also most of the uh, most of the large hospitals are within three or four hours uh, from from small villages. How can we detect it? Since we're working mostly in bioelectronics, the idea was that bulk changes in the electric, uh, electromagnetic properties of the tissue are a measure of changes in the body. Why? Because the cell membrane acts as a capacitance. The uh, fluid acts as a resistance, and if you change the ratio between the resistance and the capacitance, you can really detect uh, that uh, th there are changes in the body. So, uh, very simple, we uh, did some mathematical modeling first, and we determined also that uh, the phase shift is the most sensitive uh, measure uh, for uh, detecting changes. And we also determined through analysis that what you really need is to work in a wide range of frequencies, to do the measurement in a wide range of frequencies. And this was our first experiment with uh, a rat. We've injected saline into the abdomen of the rat, sim two simple coils, and then we measured the changes in frequency, the, the, the changes in phase, uh, as a function of frequency for different levels of saline in the abdomen, and we determined that it's really a, a very sensitive measure. 
And then because uh, Caesar is working uh, with the Mexican uh, army, they became very interested in using this technology for the brain, for detecting internal bleeding or injury in the brain. And we moved to uh, developing a device for the brain in Mexico. Uh, and again, two coils. Uh, and this is the first experiment that Cesar did on himself. And you can see here the change in phase uh, as a function, he was drinking water, and he determined changes in his hydration level in the head. And you can see that there are some very specific frequencies in which uh, this is most uh, visible. The changes are most uh, visible. Uh, we worked till about 400 megahertz. Okay? Uh, after that, you begin to see different signals. But I, I think that. Uh, it would be interesting even to see it to gigahertz frequency. You, you can get lots of information. Uh, right now, there are tests by, done by the Mexican army on this device. So this device actually has reached already a uh, clinical stage. Uh, we have <coughs> compared the measurements uh, of this device, which is simply a hat with two coils, with the MRI measurements. And uh, you can see how sensitive this is before uh, hydration, this is after hydration, and you can see there are very specific peaks that jump out when you have uh, hydration for particular frequencies. And we were even more sensitive than the MRI because uh, the MRI gives you an image. We get a measurement. So uh, we, we can tell when there is damage in the uh, tissue. And of course, we build it actually uh, uh, to connect it through the cellular phone. And uh, one of our recent studies uh, just take the device, connect it through the cellular phone to a data, data processing facility. <coughs> and you need that because you have many frequencies that you want to analyze. But, uh, uh, and uh, right now, we pretty much can do it everywhere. Actually, one experiment was we did the hydration experiment in Mexico, and we send the raw data to Jerusalem. Uh, we process the data, and we send the correct diagnosis back. Uh, now, uh, we can determine other things, but uh, and uh, Berkeley has just received uh, the patent on this uh, technology. Uh, another technology, and looking at the time, I'll, I'll, I'll finish in time. Uh, another technology is, again, related to diagnostic. Physicians are not really available everywhere around the world, and not the best physicians are available around the world. Now, uh, what are physicians? Uh, they are pretty much, uh, the, since we're, I think there are quite a few from computer science, they are highly trained classifiers. So um, essentially, they have a, a large database, and they use the d database essentially to develop uh, diagnostic. Now, one of the main problems which I actually have experienced last week has to do with biopsy samples. Uh, <coughs> if you uh, if you are uh, if you have uh, the access to a good hospital to a large hospital, and if you have some concern for cancer. Uh, in my case, it was uh, skin cancer. Then you go, you have a biopsy, and on the spot there is an expert that can do the histology and the analysis, and you don't have to wait for two weeks or, or so till people tell you what this, uh, the, the answer is. Uh, in most places, including most places in the United States, uh, you have to wait for about two weeks until you are being told you don't have cancer, which uh, was in my case. Uh, they told me it's just age, uh, so, uh, which is something that nobody can fix. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, the analysis of biopsy samples doesn't need to be so complicated, because you can build a classifier. And this is work that I've done, actually, in, uh, at the Hebrew University with Shlomi Laufer. Uh, you can build a device that works as a classifier for tissue samples, and you can send the raw data immediately. And again, 
since we worked in bioelectronics, uh, we have developed this device, which is a, an array of electrodes. You put the sample in the middle, and different tissues have different electrical impedance. And what we did is we took a liver and a kidney uh, from a rat, because the uh, ratio of electrical uh, impedance between liver and kidney is like in, for breast tissue between malignant and non-malignant breast tissue. And we have built a support vector machine uh, as a classifier. Uh, we measured, uh, I think, 15 frequencies in different configurations around this array, and we trained the classifier to recognize the two different types of tissue. And uh, again, to most of you, I don't need to explain what it is, but what you do is you develop a plane that separates two different uh, tissues from a whole array of properties. And this is our classifier, okay? This is a separation between kidney and heart. And of course, you can build bigger classifiers. And what we did is we sent the raw data through the cellular phone, through the classifier. It analyzed the data and uh, essentially uh, correct returned heart or kidney in, in our, uh, sorry, it was heart and kidney, not liver and kidney heart and kidney in our uh, case. So uh, again, we ca you can develop classifiers in diagnostics in such a way that you don't need the expert in, uh, at the site. And you can take somebody, teach somebody to take a biopsy, put it in the middle of the device. And of course, it's not only electrics, but we're working in bioelectronics mostly. It can be with other physical modalities. Uh, I have, according to my watch, nine minutes. Yes? OK. <laughs> We're negotiating? Uh, OK. So the, the other problem is cancer. Now, uh, again, cancer is another major problem. It affects everybody. One of the leading causes of death. Uh, essentially, most of the cancers occur in low and middle income countries. They don't occur here. Uh, 60% of the cancers can be treated, but the people in economically disadvantaged parts of the world don't have technology to treat it. They cannot do a radiation therapy. They, uh, they, they, they don't have a cryosurgical probe. So uh, again, with, with the idea in mind to help the people that don't have access to complicated devices, we have invented a new technology that is, turns out to be very inexpensive and it's probably the new rave now in treatment of cancer, which we're calling non-thermal irreversible electroporation, for which Berkeley also has the patents. Now, uh, this is a book that was just published uh, this year, and it has to do with electric fields and uh, cells. It, uh, this is a cell with a membrane, and it turns out that if you apply a certain uh, microsecond pulse across the cell membrane, it produces nanoscale pores in the cell membrane. It produces an instability and nanoscale pores. Uh, it looks pretty much uh, this way uh, with molecular dynamic simulation, and you can have a whole variety of phenomena taking place. But what's most interesting for treatment of cancer and our application is that it destroys the cell membrane. N not literally as this drawing shows, but pretty much produces nanoscale pores in the cell membrane, and then the cell dies. But this is a very selective methodology. It's essentially a molecular treatment because it affects only the cell membrane and no other molecule. Uh, now, the method of delivery is very simple, two electrodes. You put two electrodes around the uh, tissue and uh, pretty much uh, apply microsecond pulses, and the cells die in that uh, area. Uh, we have done some nice mathematics with Rafael de Valos. He, he was my PhD student here. When you apply electric pulses, you have also dual heating. What we have developed is a technology in which when you apply the pulses, you have only the electric effect on the cell membrane, 
but you don't have dual heating. So there is no other mechanism of damage except damage to the cell membrane, and I will show you shortly what, what, what is the significance. These are some calculations. Again, we calculate field because we're engineers. And the most interesting thing that we have observed is, is that if you apply this pulse, and remember, all you need is the technology is extremely simple. Two electrodes, you charge a capacitance, and you discharge it to these two electrodes. That's all. Uh, I believe that many of you can build it for $10, pretty much uh, here. Okay? Now, the effect is that the cells are destroyed, and this is a blood vessel. And what's interesting is that because you affect only the cell membrane, the blood vessels, the lumen, remains intact. And what we have discovered, so of course, uh, the, the, these are four electrodes, and you can see here calculations that we always do because we are engineers. We first of all discovered that we can see it on ultrasound, uh, the actual application of the pulse. And what's most surprising the, is the healing process. It turns out that because you have left the blood vessels intact, this is a cross-section in the liver, Within two weeks, the liver ends up being completely regenerated, and uh, while all the blood vessels have remained intact, and I will skip it to uh, perhaps some interesting clinical results. Uh, this has been applied in the last year and a half in 300 cases or uh, clinical cases, and uh, this comes from Australia. Again, a tumor microsecond pulses, no pain, and two weeks later, the, the liver has regenerated. Uh, it's being used in lots of applications now for the lung, and recently it has been used for the pancreas, again, because you don't destroy anything. Now, where do we go now in the future? Essentially, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm working very closely with the, uh, uh, with the uh, scientists from the Al-Quds University. And uh, one of the main problems is breast cancer uh, among the Palestinian population. And uh, it has to do with lack of diagnostic primarily because, uh, essentially this comes from a survey, primarily because of the situation and also because of the uh, circumstances in general in economically disadvantaged parts of the world. We, women just don't go to have mammographies. So our idea right now, and that's uh, what we have in the stage of development, is to develop a device for breast cancer detection based on electrical impedance tomography which essentially is just an array of electrodes, uh, to provide the device to women uh, so, so that they can check for breast cancer detection in the privacy of their home uh, without anybody bothering them. And this is essentially a whole simulation of what we're doing. And uh, the oncology can see the tumor in isolation, but we were always asked, well, okay, now the woman knows that she has breast cancer, what is she gonna do? Well, the new technology that we have developed, which pretty much requires just two needles, can be delivered at the level of even home physicians, and we have demonstrated, actually, that electrical impedance tomography can image the process of electroporation, and again, Berkeley has the issued patent on, the, on this technology. And what we hope that uh, in the future, uh, not only will we be able to detect breast cancer, we will be also able to treat breast cancer in economically disadvantaged part of the world. And I will finish with this because uh, I could keep you forever and you want to eat probably. Thank you very much. I'm not sure what, how you're handling it. Uh, there is one minute till five o'clock if you want. Questions? 
So what are the data rates that you are using to communicate to the cell phone, the images Excuse and the videos? Me? Could you repeat, please? The data rates required to communicate uh, the video. Let's put it this way. The, the first data was uh, pretty much uh, a, 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 a message uh, uh -huh. uh, because it was just six kilobytes of data. Okay. Okay, so uh, with respect to uh, the other, one of our main problems is really the large amount of data, and we're using the cellular phone uh, as a data storage device. Yes. And then we're sending it at the rate, uh, pretty much either as a file uh, of data at the, at the rate of th that, that the cell phone can, can handle. So, uh, but because we don't need uh, real time that's image, true. then yeah. that's fine. So, so right, right now that's we're sending it, uh, we've sent it as a file. And, uh, and second, a uh, meta level question I mean, these inventions are very nice. Yeah. Why do you patent them? What? Why well, uh, uh, actually, I want to emphasize that w one, one of the reasons for patenting, for, for example, the irreversible electroporation, we have not patented on purpose in India and uh, in parts of, uh, pretty much on purpose. Th this, this, this technology also, we have published and not patented in parts of the world in which uh, uh, essentially people cannot, uh, cannot afford them. So uh, on one hand, you really need some business that will uh, support your research and uh, on the other hand, uh, you want to avoid patenting in parts of the world that cannot afford it. And what we thought is that the best strategy is to patent it in the United States and Europe, publish it, and then not patent it uh, anywhere else. Uh, if you were not to do that, I don't think that anybody will touch the technology to develop it. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on ways to detect high blood pressure. I just mm, no, <laughs> I uh, I didn't think in this direction. But uh, actually, we're 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 working, for instance, right now on diabetes. But usually, the the way in which we seek projects is uh, just by going around and asking uh, what bothers uh, people in different places. So, so for instance, uh, th this is another project uh, which I'm working in the Palestinian territories. Uh, diabetes seems to be a major problem. And there is a student, actually, that will come shortly here to Berkeley from the Al-Quds University to look into diabetes. So if you can point me to somebody that is in need uh, in economically disadvantaged parts of the world uh, for measuring of blood pressure, which I presume there is. It's a big uh, problem yeah. for preeclampsia, which yeah. is so, another so top five maternal death problem. Yeah, so uh, yes. I it's the main uh, diagnostic problem. I, th I think that the beauty of what we do is we, we, we look for projects, and the emphasis is let's look for uh, projects that uh, really are not, uh, that in the United States are being solved or have been solved. Well, give me give you at least a couple more. Another one would be protein in the urine, which yeah. I think might be detectable using some of these techniques. That's yeah. another indicator for preeclampsia. Well, uh, I think we can get lots of students here <laughs> who are probably willing to work on these projects. Uh, uh, I, 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 it, you, uh, what I found is you have to put your uh, mind in a different mode of thinking because for, for the last 20 years I actually worked on several companies uh, for the United States market and uh, everything is based of course on fundamental biophysics and develop in device technology so everything is solvable uh, not everything M many things are solvable and uh, you just have to try to adjust the technology to, to other parts of the world. Uh, again, imaging is a typical example, okay? So uh, we've taken the physics of imaging and just 
found ways in which they would fit in other parts of the world. And I think the same thing can be done with blood pressure and with diabetes and pretty much every, because the physics are there, except the device technology has not been geared toward uh, those parts of the world. Yeah. One last clar yeah. clarifying question. You mentioned on the internal bleeding detection. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you need to have a kind of a prehistory reading of the patient? Uh, we, uh, what we provide is changes. Okay, so you have so to know what it was we, you, you, have, you have to have a baseline. Okay. So, uh, for instance, for maternal bleeding, we, we just uh, leave it. Uh, essentially, it's two coils around the abdomen. Mm -hmm. Same thing goes around the head. If, if somebody has an injury, uh, it replaces wait and see. It replaces checking uh, for changes in clinical signals. So, uh, in principle, these measurements could give some changes, but right now we're just uh, directing them toward, uh, they, they could analyze the baseline, but right now we're just looking at the changes. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much.